His interest in CR has evolved from being purely related to personal health and longevity into a motivation based more on the notion that CR can help one realize a more fulfilling life here and now. Thank you, Robert. Oh. Okay, so this, like several of the other talks, uh, is not going to be nearly as rigorous uh, as the other talks or my normal way of interacting with people on the list. It's going to be more, more about uh, off-the-cuff feelings about CR in general, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I hope Time-wise, maybe we can have a little bit of discussion. This is meant to more spur people to think about these issues than to solve them or be definitive about about what's going on. Um, and sort of my general thesis is that CR can have profound impact on um, the psychology of practitioners. And there are some interesting characteristics of these effects. Um, they're I think orthogonal or in many cases independent of the impact on health and, and longevity, whatever that may be in us. They can be positive or negative as we'll see and they seem to vary widely from individual to individual. Um, you know, we're all, all different. Um, they occur whether we recognize them or not. Uh, we're, we're basically doing this and to a certain extent some of these are inevitable. So it's good to recognize them and to think about them. But the insidious thing about them are sometimes they come on gradually and have the uh, characteristic that many of us consider them virtues and therefore it's sometimes hard to recognize that they may not be the best for us in, in terms of our all overall quality of life. And ever the hard-nosed scientists that I think many of us are, um, these are kind of squishy and so people have a tendency to poo-poo them and I, I don't think that's entirely appropriate either. So we'll see, I'll, I'll just see how things go, but the topics that I'm prepared to talk at some length on are the following. Um, obsessions among CR practitioners um, and the relation to appetite, appetites of all, kind, all kinds including uh, sexual appetite, um, CR, and a little bit more broadly beyond just the, the sex thing, CR and its impact on emotions. And then finally, very speculatively, CR and, and spirituality, which is something I've been, been interested in a lot lately. Um, obviously, from the, the outline, these things go from most concrete to most speculative. And as I said, it's not meant to be definitive and it's some personal observations along with some feedback that I've gotten from many people on the list through our interactions. But the usual caveat, your mileage may vary on any of these subjects. Just a little bit of my background, as I say at the bottom, I wonder why the color is so bad here. Um, my life's an open book, so I'm not going to go into too much of this. I've talked probably at more length than any of you care to hear on the list about <laughs> my various uh, various lifestyle um, components. But just for those of you who haven't, don't know me, I've been on CR for about three and a half years, since around the turn of the, the millennium. I started out at about 172 and I'm at the moment at about 120. I, I'm 5'8", so that's a BMI of around 18. Um, I exhibit all the typical markers as Sherm did. Uh, and I've got a rather unusual regime, I think even among cronies. Um, I eat the same ma meal three times a day, uh, 365 days a year. I, I may be the only one who actually brought all their food with them to this conference. Um, and I'm obviously, if you know anything about my co posts, very careful and meticulous in nearly everything I do, but particularly my diet. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm very family oriented and it's much of what I'm going to talk about has come about because of the tension between family relationships and my desire to be uh, you know, optimal in my practice of calorie restriction. So uh, that's where I'm coming from and again that's, that will bias some of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it. 
uh, CR and Obsession. It appears from a number of different sources that um, CR and Obsession, obsessive behavior, is associated. They, they go together. Um, the issue is which direction is the arrow of causality, or is there a, a, an arrow in, in either way? Um, first off, one obvious hypothesis is that CR induces some sort of obsessive behavior, a tendency towards obsessions. And there's an, uh, quite a bit of evidence to support that. Um, even in, in the rodents, there's a rodent model of anorexia in which you semi-starve these, these rodents, and I think it's typically with, with reasonable nutrition, but put them on a real, real hard, hard diet, and they begin to do what is the rodent equivalent of an obsessive behavior, and that is if you put a running wheel in their cage, they'll run uh, much, much more than just normal animals, and sometimes to the point of death if you let them. They'll just keep going. And uh, so that is, to a large extent, um, an accepted model of anorexia, an animal model of anorexia. And interestingly, in uh, treatment, these um, hyperactive mice are actually helped by certain hormones that also help the, uh, the obsessive behavior of anorexic. Uh, uh, serotonin uptake inhibitors, uh, neurotransmitter, um, as well as uh, leptin, which we all know we have low levels of, um, tend to reduce this obsessive behavior in, in rodents as well as in anorexics. Yeah. That it's some indication that there may be uh, some biological basis for the obsessive compulsive behavior that, that some practitioners of CR and uh, anorexics exhibit. Yeah. If you uh, upset the serotonin system, you could also upset the melatonin system. Sure. Sleep disturbance. Yeah. 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 Well, well, certainly anecdotal reports are that, that sleep is affected. I, I personally sleep five to five and a half hours a night and have for, for since starting CR pretty soon after and I'm never fatigued so um, so going to the human data as I think Robert said there's little human good human data on this the the best data we have <laughs> is the Minnesota starvation study which we've he heard about several times so I'll just go into a few extra details um, these people were severely calorie restricted and abruptly calorie restricted and that may have something to do with it with some of the the, the really extreme behaviors that they exhibited um, they were not nearly as self-selected a population as we were so that's another difference but nonetheless there's there's a lot of interesting uh, parallels at least to a certain degree between their behavior and some things that I've recognized in myself and I think others may uh, as well um, just a little bit of the, uh, the results. During the, the study, four of the 40 original subjects dropped out. Um, three developed binge eating. Uh, they began stealing food, became depressed, even psychotic in several, or at least in, in two instances. Um, some of the other side effects are ones we're all familiar with or have been at one time or another. Uh, hunger, weakness, lack of drive, inability to, to focus you know, and also to experience happiness, bone loss, a um, bunch of, of blood markers obviously, loss of muscle mass, loss of uh, body hair, alopecia, um, low blood pressure, poor wound healing, you know, a litany of things that, that many of us have experienced as well. So the onset and severity of what they're experiencing may be a little bit more severe than, than, than what we are. But in some cases, I mean, um, wasn't that much more in terms of absolute calorie intake, it seemed. Um, and we're seeing many of the same things in these men, or, or they did. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the, their detailed behavior on the next slide. But the one thing I found most interesting was they did a follow-up to this just a couple years ago, 50 years after the original six-month study. There were, like, 24 of these men still alive and who were willing to respond and I think virtually all of them showed 
some continued um, issues with food that this, you know, despite the fact that they'd been off it and been able to eat what they wanted for, for so many years. So that, that suggests some long-term consequences, you know, either psychological or perhaps even physical that um, persisted for a very long time. Yeah. Um, just a little bit on the other side of the coin. There's, you know, an obvious hypothesis that we just by nature are an obsessive group and are therefore drawn to this calorie restriction as a way to uh, express that and fulfill a need for control and other things that we find in our life. Um, so, in general, you know, there wasn't much difference, it appeared, from Robert's data in some of the personality uh, traits, but, you know, from my perspective, observing the group, um, introversion, uh, or the opposite of extroversion, which I guess we did see a little bit um, when compared with the dieters, um, and obviously self-discipline and persistence are probably off the ch charts if those were, were measured explicitly. Um, so that can very easily be conceptually translated into, you know, once you start something, you're going to stick to it and do it to the, to the nth degree. And so it may be the causal goes that way. We're obsessive pe people by nature, and therefore we all end up in this room together as uh, CR practitioners. So just what, what uh, form do these obsessions sometimes take? Um, one of them that I posted about on the list previously is this, uh, this idea of, of an eating disorder called orthorexia nervosa that is not quantity of food but quality of food associated. So the idea is an obsession, obsession with healthy eating and you know to a certain extent I think I've, I have suffered from this for a long time and I think many others do. Sherm accepted. Uh, oops. I do. Uh, that, that is something that, that people should be aware of. Um, that it may not be the, in your long-term best interest, both by, from quality of life and um, health, to, to be so, so anal about food choices and stuff. Um, others that, that I know are fairly common, but seemingly bizarre among cronies, and this was also seen in the Minnesota study, is obsession with uh, not so much the eating, but things associated with eating and, and food. So recipe collection was one in the Minnesota study. But, you know, I found myself in the past watching Food Network TV, Food TV, uh, just, I like to see food. Um, I subscribe to Cooking Light. I never make any recipes or used to subscribe to Cooking Light just to look at the pictures. Uh, it's, it's bizarre. Uh, but I, I suspect others in the room may relate to that. Um, Well, I mean, as I said, your mileage may vary. The, the, this isn't going to apply to everyone in the room. Well, I think one thing I do is I encourage people who are on standard diets to have desserts. I like to, yeah. I love to watch my family eat dessert. I, in I fact, them sometimes. yeah. I mean, I, at some point, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but this Munchausen yeah. syndrome, I've, I've had serious concern that, you know, I encourage them. Sometimes I even cook food for them that is not very healthy, and I, I relish watching them enjoy it. I, I would not partake in it myself, and, and you know, my sort of Munchausen syndrome is when parents hurt their kids for their own reasons, bizarre reasons, and uh, you know. Um, so another thing that I've suffered from, and I know others have as well, is obsession with taste. As I think Robert or somebody alluded to, I'm virtually never hungry anymore. Up until about six months though ago, I was focused on taste to, an ent to, to a very large degree. I wanted to experience lots of strong tastes and would go to pretty extreme lengths to, to do that, culminating in, the, in this whole thing of food tasting, which if anyone on the list, Sherm, you may not even know about this, but there were some of us, myself, one of the, the charter members who was chewing food and spitting it out just to experience the taste and the mouthfeel of it. And, uh, you know, when I sunk to that level, I 
that was part of the motivation for, for thinking about some of this and saying, you know, I gotta wake up, get my priorities straight. Um, so, you know, and, and there are other list members who've either come from or headed towards more serious eating disorders because of this, this tendency. Um, and just, this may be a result of this uh, a scarcity mentality. You focus on food because you're restricting it and you basically want to maximize the enjoyment or the uh, experience that you are willing to uh, allow yourself. So that could explain why we're so obsessed on the, the foods that we do eat. Um, branching out a little bit from just obsession, obsessing over food itself, I've also recognized in myself a tendency or, or have in the past to obsess over um, wasting or hoarding of various things. Uh, food in general, uh, unwillingness to throw out food even if I no longer would eat it. You know, I make a dietary choice no longer to eat wheat, wheat uh, bran or something like that. And I have stocked up because, you know, you have to be prepared. So I've got, you know, pounds of wheat bran in my freezer because you have to keep it in the freezer, obviously. Um, and it sits there for a year because I'm not willing to throw it out. Maybe I'll change my mind later, but I never do. And eventually my freezer gets too full, so I do have to cull some stuff out, but it's, it's that kind of thing. Another one, uh, supplements. You buy supplements and you change your mind, oh, I don't really think I should be taking this. Or here's a better version of the supplement, but I gotta use up the old stuff before I throw out the new stuff. Or before I start, use up the old stuff before I throw out, use, you know what I mean. So I think, you know, I hope this is striking home with some people out there in the audience. <laughs> I'm not, just not revealing my own idiosyncrasies and uh, talking to a dumbfounded audience, but uh, even things like stockpiling rubber bands. Produce comes with a ru rubber band around it. You know, those might come in handy someday. <laughs> so I've got a big box of rubber bands. It's like, what am I doing? Uh, I store them in the bag, Dean. Yeah. Yeah. Ziploc bags. Does anyone reuse their Ziploc bags? Oh, yeah. Is a positive mental attitude and just cold turkey. Um, cut out the negative activities, you know, the obsession with watching food TV and find more healthy outlets for it. And then, at the same time, the healthy outlets, force yourself to do them, and not only do them, because I did them before, but have the attitude, I'm gonna do them, and damn it, I'm gonna have fun doing it. And what I found was, it worked. Over time, you can come to appreciate the things that you didn't, that, that were, you didn't grudgingly previously. Um, you know, helping the family, that sort of thing. And I'll get more into that in a little while. But it's, what I'll, I'll preview is there's a positive feedback loop. If you start to engage more, your acquaintances, relationships will benefit. They'll relate to you more, they'll respect you more, and they'll give you less hassle about your CR, and you'll have a richer um, set of relationships, and that will feed upon itself. You'll get a, a warm fuzzy from, um, you know, the, the extra affection you get from your kids because you're chasing after them and that will encourage you to go further and so it, it sort of gets you out of this hunkered down mentality is, is basically what I found. Um, and as a result, I've you know received a lot of personal reward from overcoming this obsession and that, that has been the basis, I think, a catalyst for many of the other positive steps, I think, that I'll, I'll speak of in a moment. 